uh, it's a bit like if you were to ask some very important person's secretary, where is the boss? Uh, she will never tell because she has been trained not to tell. But if you say, when is Anand coming back from China? She will correct you. But he is not in China, he is in Japan. Mm. She will correct you. She won't give you the answer, but she will correct you. And, and so anybody who says, I don't have the time, you can't be busier than a Mukesh mm. Ambani or you can't be busier than a Bill Gates and you are aware of this that each one of these leaders has their own way of constantly learning and updating them. Who is a powerful leader? A powerful leader is one in whose room when you enter and come out, you feel powerful. You feel energetic. A powerless leader is one in whose room if you go, you are scared and when you come out, you are like half of what you were earlier. Captain Raghu Raman sir, thank you for being on the Ranveer show once again. Three times in a row. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, we just recorded our Hindi episode which was about the army. Uh, this is our second English episode. Our first one was received extremely well. I've never had so many people write in to me about uh, thanking me for a particular guest. So there's a lot of young aspiring army cadets. Uh, a lot of people who wanted to build their careers in the army. I think that's what that episode did for the world. Uh, honestly, this one, I'm doing it from a very personal, selfish perspective. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to extract all your learnings because you've had a very um, how to, complex career. Like, uh, I feel like after the army, you evolved into this corporate badsha, as we call it. And then you've done a bunch of different things in the corporate world. You've also had a stint with Reliance. You've uh, worked with Mukesh Ambani, as we spoke about in the last podcast. Uh, while I know that that's not a big deal, I got to sell some masala to my audiences. No, I mean, it's a big <laughs> deal to work with uh, Mukesh Ambani. I mean, yes. all said and done. 100%. He is a, a corporate leader of a very, very different caliber in a very, very different era. I mean, exactly. I don't know, 10 years, 15 years down the line when they write the history of the way Indian telecom evolved and how people have got access, including millions of people who probably now have access to shows like yours. And I've actually given life to a completely different uh, medium of learning, communication, healthcare. His name is going to be there in that uh, chapter as a person who did all of that. So. He's going to be a massive section of this particular episode. Um, but you've also gotten access to a lot of powerful people, famous people, uh, so-called rich people over you know the course of your career. You've had learnings from them. And I know that you're one of those fierce learners that I know personally. So, um, let's just talk about your career. And as we do with every podcast, I'm going to stop you and ask you for sure. my tangential. So, let me start uh, from leaving the army. And this happened uh, in 1998. Uh, it was uh, 15th of August, I remember, my last day. That's army sense of humor. You know, <laughs> Independence Day. <laughs> so, <laughs> I left them. And actually, um, like many things that happen to uh, army folks when they leave, their initial first point of contact is usually an ex-army person who's left ahead of you. And, and in my case, it was a, I was very lucky that I had a coastmate, uh, not a coastmate, a unit officer who, who was part of my unit called Captain Alok Parashar, who was a SS of short service officer who had left uh, before me. And he had joined the Mahindra group. And at that point, when I was leaving, I was my last posting was in a place called Ahmednagar, which is, uh, you might be aware, about uh, three hours away from uh, Pune. And uh, what had happened was that an uh, institution called the Mahindra United World College, the UWC, the United World College, this is a very famous institution. You should Google it up. Matter of fact, I encourage all listeners who are uh, in the age group to appear for their 10th uh, exam. They should look at this uh, UWC as a concept. It's, it's revolutionary. Uh, the one in India is uh, sponsored was sponsored by the Mahindra Group, and that's why it's called the Mahindra United World College. But it's on top of a mountain in Mulshi, and amongst its 200 students, it has close to about 80 to 90 countries being represented there. Oh, so wow. it's a very, very rich, multicultural environment, a very novel concept yeah. of education where they say that we put kids who are from different cultures, who have learned their own cultures, but are still at an age where they're open to learning other cultures and put them together. And so you put a German and an Israeli and a French and a Spanish guy in one room. So when they move away from there, uh, they know that at least there is one good German whom I can talk to. You know? So it, it is to produce this uh, 
कॉलेज ऑफ लीडर्स सो टू स्पीक कॉलेजियम ऑफ लीडर्स हु एज दे ग्रो विल नो इच अदर मल्टीकल्चरल दैट वॉज द कॉन्सेप्ट सो दिस स्कूल वॉज बींग सेट अप एंड दिस इज द ईयर नाइनटीन नाइन्टी एट वैन इंटरनेट वॉज स्टिल आई मीन यू गैज वॉन्ट इवन रिमेंबर द टोन ऑफ अ मोडम इट यूज टू मेक दैट वियर फनी साउंड एंड इट वॉज फोर्टीन के पी बी एस वॉज कंसिडर्ड टू बी लाइक हाई स्पीड इट वॉज दोज डेज and i was still uh, in the uh, army i was uh, it was my last month last couple of months and uh, i remember captain alok parash calling me from uh, pune once and saying that uh, hey listen we got this thing called the internet and there's something i don't understand this uh, stuff so can you just come over and you know sort of sit on our side of the table because we are discussing with a few vendors about you know this kind of uh, internet connectivity and all of that stuff so i kind of knew enough about computers at that time you learned it in the uh, army yes i was working on a few projects which required me to learn uh, a lot about computers and a lot about technology and that's another advantage by the way of working in the government and especially in the forces you get uh, you get to work with technology which is ahead of its time. ahead of its time i mean i don't think i i learned my computers in the military college of telecommunication engineering mct is a short course but i learned my programming on a mainframe and mainframe i mean i i don't think even mnc's could afford a mainframe at that point of time so mm. you do have uh, a lot of exposure and of course a lot of it was learned also with my job because i uh, was in a, a branch of the army which was the mechanized infantry and that did have uh, second generation missiles which had some uh, sort of computing power on board and so you needed to understand the fundamentals of computing and of course a large part of uh, learning in life is your personal passion so i was passionate about uh, computers so i um, came to attend this meeting and this was uh, i'm seeing this college for the first time it is still under construction it's getting built and uh, there were a few vendors who had come to give their proposals and essentially they gave a non feasibility report they said that you know internet connectivity can't be brought over here and there are reasons for that the reason is that firstly it was 40 kilometers away from pune and pune was the nearest city where there was internet to begin with mm. secondly this was on top of a mountain which is in the middle of a reserve forest so you either had to draw a cable all the way from pune to this place a fiber optic cable or you had to set up uh, relay stations you know uh, uh, which is radio based relay stations now radio based relay stations could not be set up because the area from pune to the college it was interspersed with mountains and these mountains were reserve forests so not only would you have to put a tower on each one of them but you would also have to service the tower which means you need a track to reach that place to fill up diesel it was not feasible and uh, drawing a fiber optic cable all the way from pune right up to the college was also impractical because mtnl or mn you know whatever the vsnl they were not going to lay a cable for a school at the other end hmm. and a school which would because it's an academic institution pay one fourth of the fee anyway so one customer they they won't do that so anyway there's a non feasibility report was given and i remember sitting there in that uh, table uh, and i think i just muttered and it was a stupid sentence to say but i kind of said it that i mean if connectivity can be provided in the glacier why can't it be done here very silly statement to make because the stakes are different and all the but the then headmaster uh, dr david wilkinson who set up this college he oh, kind hold of hold on so i just want to give the listeners some context sure you also served in on the siachen glacier yeah i mean and I, uh, me and 80% of the indian army so it's uh, it's that's that's the glacier we're speaking of that's but the, anyway so it it is yeah so what i meant was that it can be done in difficult places so why can't it be done here of course the context is completely different and that was a silly statement to make but uh, the headmaster he caught on to that and that was the end of the story i went back to nagar and after a couple of weeks i got another message from uh, captain parashar and said that can you come over to bombay there's a meeting in bombay so i said okay fine and i came on a saturday i remember and it was in mahindra towers so this is the first time i'm seeing i still remember i tell some of my friends even now that when he was telling me to look for a landmark he said this all india radio tower is the biggest landmark and i now sometimes go on the ceiling you can't even see the tower because mm. <laughs> because of the skyscrapers that have come but that point of time mahindra towers sixth floor building was called a mahindra tower <laughs> right so i uh, went there for this meeting and uh, uh, mr harish mahindra anand anand's father was alive and it was his personal you know he was passionate about this project and 
it's a saga of how the project I, it wouldn't have got done but for him and there was this whole uh, team sitting there and i remember uh, david wilkinson sort of introducing uh, me to them and saying that he said that he can do it so i said i didn't say i can do it i said it can be done so he said would you be willing to take up this and i said fine i'll give it a shot and that's how i joined the mahindra college with the very limited objective of setting up the internet connectivity hmm. and honestly and i think that's a philosophy i followed learned and followed throughout my life uh, and i think that's what the army teaches you i didn't know how the hell i'm going to do it i had no idea and there are the three companies which had given a non feasibility report and these are three technology companies so i did not know how i was going to do it but i knew i was going to get it done ke hona to hai karna hai so then of course i went figured out talk to various people talk to companies who might be able to help this that all of those things and then we found a, a breakthrough the breakthrough was that while there was no way to connect a fiber optic cable all the way from pune to this college which is on top of a mountain in a village called khubavali and by the way those days the telephone exchange there was not even digital it was actually a mechanical telephone exchange i don't know if you might have seen it in movies that you know a, a dial goes up and turns around and then falls back and it's completely mechanical so no way that the entire system would have to be rehauled so i went to uh, the uh, director of uh, the telecom there dr rupia i still remember his name uh, dr rupia i went to him and i told him that you know we need this connectivity and he said the same thing to me captain sir i mean at the other end of this pipeline there is a school so commercially this has got no viability and all of that to us so this was the year 1999 <clears throat> so i just told him you know we've got this 200 kids there and they come from this 80 different countries they keep asking me one question they say if india can blow a nuclear bomb why can't you give us internet connectivity to sir aap jawab de do mere ko main ja ke bachcho ko bata deta hu he suddenly to get to get okay so the prestige of the country we have to find a way out hmm. and that you know become that became that was i think my first learning that if you make something larger than just some bits and bytes if you make something that is a a dragon that has to be killed and a a a, a a task that has to be done for the prestige for the honor then usually impossible tasks get done because everyone puts their shoulder to it mm-hmm. everyone puts their you know might to it and this project uh, got a life of its own we also called it uh, project megdoot you know megdoot being cloud messenger and it's also again comes from my experience in siachen because that is also called megdoot yes so uh, uh, we decided eventually the solution that was found was that if we cannot get connectivity using radio right up to pune up to where can we get connectivity and there's a place called pirangut which now is a big industrial hub but at that point of time was hardly there was one telephone exchange there so the um, telecom authorities agreed to lay a fiber optic cable up to pirangut and from pirangut we were supposed to pick it up using a radio modem which at that point of time a 17 km radio modem was probably one of the longest links for an educational institution definitely it was the longest link and that got set up and that was the first time that uh, internet came to that play matter of fact those of you who are interested in that area or know that place listeners if you go to mulshi you can s- still see that tower which was on top of a mountain which actually started not only the internet but the first telecom services to come into that valley came because of that tower because it was at a at a very high point matter of fact the mahindra group bought a mountain because that was the only place from where we had where a window which was a line of sight to pirangut so we actually traveled foot by foot every part of that landscape to see from where we had a line of sight and we got the line of sight and we connected that and i still remember the message the first message which went out from there and you have to understand this this is like about uh, 100 uh, 150 180 kids who come from other countries and they have no link with their i mean they if you have to communicate with your parents there was there was actually a case i, I remember the at that time in yugoslavia the bombing was going on nato bombing was going on and there was a student from yugoslavia whose city was being bombed and he had no way of knowing whether his parents are okay or not okay because there was no i mean telephones were the only communication then that also std trunk call this that so the first time we got connectivity the first message which went out was uh, geography is history and that was the first message that we sent out from the college and mahindra college actually became the eighth college to get internet connectivity including 
two colleges in other countries who still had not got the connectivity and we got it and i still remember um, mr harish mahindra when he gave me the mandate he told me it has to be done before august <clears throat> so i asked him i said what's the hurry and he said that i don't want a single student who decided to come to india to this college to turn around and say that my education was shortchanged because i chose india so any student who passes out from here including the first batch cannot say that i did not get internet that's the criticality i mean i admire the the vision of that man to mm-hmm. say that you know so anyway we did it and when that got done um, i was invited by anand to come to the you know they have this uh, technology board Uh, in which they have the ceos of all the technology companies now interestingly one of the companies which gave a non feasibility report was a mahindra company and that's why i think they wanted to figure out who this guy who did it and you know was called mm-hmm. and of course i mean i was only representing the team that did it the team consisted of many people including the uh, the dot guys also they were also very excited about it because you know it was a big uh, thing for them So I came here for a presentation, and after the presentation, Anand and and this was my job. I mean, I was brought in for this particular project, and after the project was over, I was basically looking at you know other stuff, and I had a couple of offers from other companies like IBM and the others, and I was looking at evaluating options there. What were you thinking after the army? Like after you've like seen and learned to whatever you've seen and learned in the army? It was a different world when I came out into the civil world, but you know the the. the good part was i unlike many of my other coursemates who come from nda scenic school in da and all of that i actually had uh, worked in the cv street i mean i was a graduate from venkateshwara so i knew a little bit more about and i had a lot of friends who were in corporates and all of that and i thought you know it was a different world i wanted to explore and uh, so anand kind of point blank asked me uh, why don't you work with the group and i said okay <laughs> why not mm. and uh, <clears throat> fascinating i mean i i still think about that conversation it's almost surreal because he asked me what would you like to do and i told him point blank i used to be a company commander in the army so give me a company and he burst out laughing and he said that this is the first time someone has just <laughs> asked me to <laughs> be made a ceo and he said you know what i'm actually going to do that mm. and there were three companies at that point of time which were uh, which they were looking for a ceo and one of them happened to be a company called automart india which today is called first choice so i was the second ceo of first choice i mean there was a founder and then was nikhil raghavan who was a ceo before me and then i became the third ceo and of course it was a job that i think i was totally unprepared for because uh, well i knew how to do teams and projects and this and that i had no idea about pnl and uh finances and because that's not something that you're taught in the army ever i mean in the army your entire financial planning consists of making your mess bill and your salary slip match mm-hmm. and if it matches it's okay if it doesn't match uh, don't drink for a few days and it'll match mm-hmm. so <laughs> that that's your financial planning uh but here i had to actually i remember still i had to count the number of zeros to figure out whether it was a lakh or a crore and then the private equity guys would convert it into millions of dollars and i had to start all over again so it was totally a new area for me made a lot of mistakes Uh, but one of the things i found fascinating about the mahindra group and uh, anand especially that he had a eye and i'm not saying it because he recruited me but he had a eye for taking a bet on people and and they would normally be people who would never ever get uh, entry into the organization through the normal channel and and there's a great lesson i've learned from him uh, he 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 would take a punt on people who would have some sort of a maverick behavior or some sort of a uh, a streak which was not normal positive eccentricities maybe you can call it that maybe you can call it the his ability to spot a can do attitude or whatever it is i mean he 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 uh, that's his that's for his podcast when he does with you <laughs> but uh, he uh, would then give a fairly free hand he would not uh, he would not try to look over your shoulder and not deal. and I know that I know this now because those days I did make a few mistakes because I tried to translate my style of leadership from the army directly into the corporate which doesn't work because they are two different worlds and uh, uh, he he helped me correct those mistakes sometimes in a nice way sometimes in not a such a nice way and I kind of cut my teeth in in that organization in uh, in first choice learned a lot about technology about the web and and that's by the way the first 
technology boom the mm-hmm. first dot com bubble uh, so so a lot of these companies like ebay and uh, so many of them which are now uh, big ones at that point of time as fledgling companies being uh being uh, sort of funded and all of those things technology being and a lot of those technologies like databases how do you make two different portals talk to each other like uh, first choice was a auto portal which was also on rediff and then it was on yahoo also so how do you interface with different technologies different processes how can you have a one username and password seamlessly going through three different portals but there are three so it was very complex and we were trying to mm. figure it out and i think the great thing was all of us were trying to figure it out so it wasn't like you know somebody sitting in mahindra towers knew it all nobody knew it all it was like the youngsters were discovering it on a daily basis and it was evolving that entire thing was evolving so it was a great experience learning that uh parallelly actually uh, i was fascinated by the area of information security and uh, i think in first choice i had reached a point of time where uh, my capability to lead the organization uh, would not be enough for the organization to go to the next level and there was a change of a ceo uh, vinay sanghi took over from me and then i moved from there back to my parent company which was mahindra network services limited which constructed this entire uh, portal and there i started a entity called the mahindra special services group now this was i'll tell you, tell you what, the story what is what is information security first i'll come to that so <clears throat> today information security is like very well known to everybody and that's why you have these password thefts and credit card frauds and money being siphoned out emails being intercepted uh, videos being stolen uh, twitter accounts being hacked and messages being sent out in your behalf all of these things are happening today because it's much more evolved but when it began uh, at that point of time basically people were completely unaware of anything other than a username and a password that's it they would write down their password they still do it but at that point of time it was much more uh, rudimentary they would write down their passwords in places and all of that they would go into an internet cafe and and start checking their mail not realizing that all cafes could have a key logger in it and they could be logging all your keystrokes including your email id and password still happens by the way mm. one of the most common ways of uh, hacking is harvesting you know uh, passwords from there so information security was actually making its uh, sort of presence felt because a lot of now transactions were happening online uh money was being moved around banking was beginning to uh, become online banking portals were coming up so this was a space that would require a lot of attention and i still remember <laughs> so i needed to get uh, so I, i had this business plan to say that we need to focus on information security and at that point of time i wasn't even thinking of starting a business out of it i was thinking more for mahindra and mahindra we need to have better information security so i decided uh, without uh, i mean uh, without seeking permission i decided to do a penetration test it's called penetration testing now those days it was just me fiddling around to see whether i can get access into and i remember i sent a mail to anand mahindra saying that this is the first half of your password oh wow and i hope i have got your attention i need to explain this concept to you so of course when anyone gets the first half of his password sent to him uh, <laughs> they usually get the attention of the sender mm. So I explained this concept to him and I said I just want to do a test of uh, uh, Mahindra. And uh, when I did the test of Mahindra of course those days most corporates they were leaking like a sieve because information security wasn't really a uh, focus I mean the people didn't even know a- mm. at that point of time. So uh, in the entire uh, I remember the IT um, leaders were present and I did a presentation which basically you know kind of stripped the uh, uh, the the IT Uh, protection team and all of that and of course as i told you i was very very naive and i was i think at that time playing to the gallery and all of that i was doing a overkill but in effect i got the first mandate to implement it for mahindra and mahindra and that's where it began the the kernel of the company began there uh and then of course uh, anand was kind enough to speak to uday kotak and uh, uday uh, decided to give us a chance and that was our first external assignment 5 mm. lakhs i still remember Uh, first external mandate I and mean, we just two of us who started the company and then of course it grew it grew became bigger and bigger and today of course it's uh, considered to be one of the leading uh, companies more importantly i think a lot of our uh, team members of that company went on to become some very very good uh, information security practitioners and matter of fact even as i'm speaking to you now most of the foundations of information security uh, in the big four 
uh, you will find that the dna comes from mahindra ssg that's where they come from and mm-hmm. of course many of the leaders went and and i think that is something that i was exceptionally proud of even when i used to do recruitment into uh, uh, mahindra ssg i would always uh, find people who are far far better than me so uh, when i would be even recruiting from people who were leaving the army they were like two or three sort of honors who who were like toppers of their batches who who had come and joined and also i was surrounded by incredibly capable people who are far better thinkers far better uh, you know sort of uh, far more competent uh, people and many of them have gone on to create their own uh, i remember sm kumar is one of them he's now heads uh, several companies and does all the, that does the army add anything specifically in this domain oh huge i think uh, the see the security is a state of mind and most hackers i can tell you this i've i've spent almost four decades in that uh, life in that world I don't think till now a 256 bit encryption has been uncracked uh, so you don't need to go for fight well what usually happens is a human error it's always a human error and human beings can be cracked all the time mm-hmm. psychologically human beings are uh, i mean the psychological uh, or what they call social engineering is a wrong phrase but it's actually mind hacking they hack into your mind they mm-hmm. make you do what The, it's a bit like if you were to ask some very important person's secretary where is the boss uh, she will never tell because she has been trained not to tell but if you say when is anand coming back from china she'll correct you but he's not in china he's in japan mm. she'll correct you she won't give you the answer but she'll correct you so if you understand the psychology of of uh, criminals because you have to fight them then you understand how to create a, a protective barriers. you know barriers against them and large part of that is actually the user education educating the user about what can go wrong how it can go wrong and all of those things so anyway so that continued for a while and then that company came to a, a size where like most consulting firms it really could not grow beyond the consulting firms which are boutique consulting firms don't really uh, uh, grow in scale Mm. Uh, because it's it's very manpower and personality intensive and uh, scaling means adding more people which means more cost so eventually you come to that sweet spot of of a certain amount of a turnover beyond which if you try to take it then the boutiqueness goes away and you know it's something there and by this time i was doing many other things also within the group uh, uh, in in the mahindra group i was and of course learning a lot learning about uh, how corporates work learned a lot about sales because i i think one of the most important things that everybody should learn is sales because with sales you learn one very important lesson and that lesson is not to take rejection personally mm. you go and pitch to 10 customers only 3 of them will buy it because only 3 out of 10 will buy but the remaining 7 when they reject you they're not rejecting you the individual they are rejecting and they may be rejecting for n number of reasons and some of them may have nothing to do with you mm. but that ability to take rejection ability to go and say ah sir okay sir no problem we'll come back again we'll try again and all of that that actually was a very solid training ground also i knew that unlike many of my uh, colleagues i did not have a formal education in the management theory so formal as in an mba so i have not studied advertising i have not studied finance i have not studied but as a ceo i needed to understand all of that i needed to understand the nuances of that and i still remember there were friends uh, i mean one of my friends called prabir talati who is again a very big guy in the private equity space today i remember going literally to his house and sitting at his feet i remember sitting on the floor he would take out his laptop and say samjha de bhai ye sgna kya hota hai what is the bloody sgna mm. and he would explain to me line by line the items on it and say this is irr this is internal rate of return this is what investors look at da, da. so learning from them i had another friend called vivek kamath who actually heads this company called matrix which manages a lot of celebrities many of the celebrities yeah. you you interview are managed by him and he at that point of time used to work in an advertising agency so he would teach me the nuances of advertising that you you know give only one message at a time you don't confuse the audience with too many messages and all so i was literally learning the nuances of various different trade crafts that are required uh, in 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 business from the masters and and sitting at their feet which i found is one of the best models for me to learn mm. i i studied like that throughout my school throughout my college i've always gone to somebody who has been really good at that subject and just said jab tu revise karta hai na mere ko bitha le ya side mm. mein you know i'll just listen to you and i'll i'll understand it if i have some questions i'll ask you and all of that so 
I understood the importance of learning at a very early stage, even when I came into the corporate, that you need to learn not only about your area of specialization, but every other vertical that will affect you. And, and this is a story that I've often narrated to people to illustrate another, you know, aspect. And I think it's important to uh, to narrate this story to explain um, what are the two routes you can take in, in, in a corporate or in any career? What are the two routes you can take and how making that choice uh, can actually end in a different result? So... Um, in a certain year, I was, there was a team which was sent from Mahindra. Four people went from Mahindra. This was, uh, the team was led by Mr. Bharat Doshi, who was at that point the CFO of Mahindra and Mahindra. And uh, he is currently a SEBI member, SEBI or RBI member, uh, or was, I think. And uh, the second person was uh, Mr. Ullas Yargop, who until uh, quite recently was heading the IT sector for and uh, we had uh, Vinit Nair, who was then heading the uh, MBT, Mahindra, before Satyam, the Mahindra British Telecom entity, Tech Mahindra, as it was called at that point of time. And a very junior uh, CEO of a small company called Mahindra SSG. Uh, I must have been in my late, mid-30s or late 30s at that point of time. We were sent to meet Michael Bloomberg. So a lot of people in my peer group asked that how were you selected to go? I mean, I can understand these three people going. So the story was that uh, Mr. Bloomberg and Mr. Mahindra met each other in one of the Davos conferences. They shook hands and they said we should do some work together. So um, Bloomberg had told him that, okay, send a team from your side and we will see what we can do and all of that. And I was part of that team. Now, I remember many of my younger, you know, sort of uh, uh, colleagues asking me that, but what was the route? I mean, how did you, how were you picked to go there? Or what, what happened? And I think I tried to answer that question to myself also. And I, I found the answer, which is the answer I want to share with you. And I think this particularly defines a way of thinking about work, a way of thinking about life. So the story actually goes back many years, two or three years before that, when I was part of a company called Mahindra Consulting. And this was a division of Mahindra Consulting. Mahindra Special Services Group was a division of Mahindra Consulting. And we were uh, going to participate in one of these NASCOM, SHASCOM kind of conferences. So we were supposed to make brochures. I mean, not we, the PR person was supposed to, COPCOM person was supposed to make a brochure. Now that lady who, uh, very competent person, who is now uh, uh, head of COPCOM of a very, very big company, she kind of came to all of us practice heads and said, can you give me a paragraph about your practice? Whatever you do, can you give me a paragraph about your practice? We wrote, I wrote whatever, I, you know, we provide the services, blah, 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 all of that to go into the brochure. So after the first proof came, printer sent the first proof, uh, they came to us for the draft and check. So I checked mine, I found one or two typos, I corrected it and all of that. And then as a habit, I checked the remaining brochure. And when I checked the remaining ones, I found some mistakes in the others. It wasn't really mistakes, but it was a flow of the language because every person had written it individually. It was like, we also do this, we also do this, we also, it didn't like flow together very well. So I just corrected the flow to the best of my ability and of course, gave it to uh, this lady who of course must have done a much better job on it and it got printed and you know, all of that happened, blah, blah, blah. <coughs> so that event got over. Next year, the same thing was to be done again. But at this point, or by this point of time, the head of Copcom had left us and joined another company. And so she wasn't there anymore. Mm -hmm. So when the CEO was trying to figure out how to get it done, the printer told the CEO, there's one captain who was involved in it last time and all of that. So mm -hmm. I was called and told, hey, can you handle this? And I said, okay, okay, I'll handle that. None of my job. It was not my business. But I learned at that point of time that you must adopt a one and a half portfolio mindset. That mindset is I will do my job completely, but I'll also handle a half portfolio. I'll take over some part which is giving a headache to the CEO or to the CFO or some part, a difficult customer or a difficult territory or something where I can take my excess bandwidth and provide mm. in that area. Not because I want to do it for them, but I want to learn about Copcom. I want to learn about communication. I want to learn how much time does it take for a printer to turn around a brochure. Mm. I want to learn what is the difference between offset and letterpress printing. I want to learn which color works very well in an advertisement. Mm. I learned that yellow is the best color in an advertisement because it stays longest in the sun. So when mm. you put a hoarding, 
the yellow color fades out the last and that is why yellow is better and better contrast and that's why it's used in traffic lights also so you learn these kind of things only when you go in that half portfolio not your portfolio but the one and a half portfolio yeah, this is generally a very good professional lesson that always do more than what's asked so when somebody is asked me that how did you reach that place the answer is here the answer is by correcting a paragraph that is not your business that is somebody else's business the answer is by putting a shoulder in someone and say yaar ye thoda main samjha deta hu tere ko because i know how to do it ya itna zyada workload i give some to me yaar let, let me handle some of this or you need another member in that interview panel i am more than happy to come and offer that to you mm. uh, you want to bounce off something this construct of being able to spread a certain amount of your mojo certain amount of your resources in an area that is directly not yours but somebody else's not doing it with some altruistic mindset that that is a wrong approach it's you're trying to kid yourself that i am bringing it is more to say i am getting an opportunity to learn about this at zero risk i'm not being graded on that if this mm. copcom thing goes down the drain nobody is going to ask me oh, why did your copy did not work because it's not my job but i'm getting an opportunity to learn from somebody else i'm getting an opportunity so this forced me for example to read books like david ogilvy on advertising i learned about communication i learned about various different things because it was a task that i had taken on and i think this philosophy is something that i have carried forward entirely in my life i mean i remember after this uh, uh, stint in mahindra ssg uh, there was a joint venture which mahindra and mahindra was doing at that point of time with bae and uh, for the joint venture a ceo was being searched for and i was actually uh, anand told me that we are picking you as the ceo and i was at that point of time again i give him credit one of the youngest ceos to be given a portfolio which was potentially this large mm. i was maybe about 42 43 at that point of time and uh, a, a much much bigger uh, canvas uh, a canvas that yes while i was in the army but it was much much bigger than that because this was about defense procurement this was about interface with the government it was about understanding procurement policies and all of those things so uh when i went into that jv also i would often try to find things that are not part of my portfolio Uh, so for example in mahindra we had a relationship with several other organizations like rand and a few others and i would i would take up that role i'd say okay i will sort of head that uh, interface because it would teach it would teach a lot more mm. i think this philosophy uh, is something that i have tried to encourage you know all all people to practice and again with the caveat that you're not taking on that half portfolio because you're doing anyone a favor you're doing it because you will get an opportunity to learn something that is not in your area and no strategic leader at least in my uh, thinking no strategic leader can ever become a strategic leader without understanding domains that are not her core competence mm. uh, you you can be the greatest cfo in the world but you're not going to become a ceo unless you understand marketing unless you understand human mm. resources you understand technology it's not possible you don't have to master it but you need to have a very good understanding of how it works what are the nuances of that what are the compulsions of that if you don't understand that uh, you may be very good in your silo and you will reach to the head of your silo but it will be very unlikely that you will be the overall commander because the overall commander needs to know a little bit about many other facets because it's all of these facets working together which mm. actually delivers the uh, end result whatever mm. that may be in terms of taking a company to mm. the next level or Yeah. Or, or finances or whatever this is also a very good example of you know when people say oh you have to have an mba to progress in the corporate world hmm. uh, would you would you say that if you offer these things if you are if you outperform everyone else by like taking on more work you do have a better chance for progress so i will not advocate if somebody says oh is it important to do an mba or not i would not have an opinion either way on it so for example uh in my last uh, uh, assignment or even before that i have had uh, juniors uh, reporting it to me let's say 50 of them and if somebody told me out of this 50 20 are from ivy league colleges 20 are from b you know second level b schools and 10 are without mba honestly i wouldn't be able to tell you who's who because that's an entry ticket into a corporate after that it depends on who is performing how and who is got 
passion who's got i i i i genuinely think passion outweighs i would any day want to have a colleague who is passionate and hungry ha karenge sir karenge we will figure out a way kuch na koi tarika nikalenge rather than have a harvard graduate who will show me in a 120 slide presentation why it cannot be done hmm. right so nobody needs to be shown michael potter's five forces on why it can't be done what people are looking for is how can it be done now that doesn't take away there's got nothing to do with mba that doesn't take away i mean i've done many executive mba programs after that i've done it from kellogg from insiad several other places uh, and of course you learn great frameworks there is no denying that you come across um, uh, managed like i've worked uh, studied under deepak jain i mean the legendary uh, uh, sort of uh, head of uh, strategy and all of that stuff now in spending one hour in his presence will give you experience which is worth like a decade Uh, the plus it's like reading a book you might read 400 pages and find one idea in that and that one idea could alter your entire life mm. you know it could alter it will give you a completely new so it's never about the number of pages it's number never about the amount of time that you spend with a person but it's about your curiosity and your passion and to you know seek out those opportunities yeah? i still remember deepak jain came to give a, or rather conduct a session for us mahindra leaders and we were all mahindra uh, we had gone to this uh, place in nasik where mahindra is that training establishment uh, bodhi vriksh or something it's called and he we were 80 leaders 70 80 leaders and he was there and he did his whole strategy or whatever but i made it a point to make sure that i was in the car which was dropping him to the airport mm. i got that one hour more with him and in that one hour more you know i was picking his mind i was of course i must have been asking very amateurish questions but that one hour getting with him was actually more valuable i mean that was a more value add and that didn't come because anyone sent you an invite i i have realized this one thing and i often advocate <coughs> you will never get an invitation to the high table nobody wants you at the high table uh, it's already crowded they're trying to kick people out of the high table you have to move chairs and you have to pull your chair in and sit in the high table and that you can only do by taking that initiative is it okay gaadi mein chale jata hu i'll go in that one hour with the vehicle nobody is this not there on the timetable but hey someone has got to drop him to the airport the gaadi is going let me sit in the car. now that ability to find the opportunities uh, again it's not a prerogative of an mba or a non mba but i think non mbas have to hustle a lot more mm. and because they have to hustle a lot more in their lives they are uh, perhaps much better at grabbing split fleeting opportunities whereas people who come again i'm being very cautious here you will find you know people like that on, people both, on sides. both sides but people who have got a very formal structure of solving problems whenever they'll see a problem they'll try to go back to a case study which solves it mm. or they'll try to look for the hammer for this particular nail whereas people who have who don't have that uh, uh, structure may sometimes actually have the audacity to try something which is completely uh, mm. unthought of i'm not saying they'll all succeed many of them will fail and they do fail but i think uh, a, a nice mix is uh, uh, ideal for an organization so uh, an organization i think should ideally have some people who have very structured thinking and some people who have unstructured and creative thinking and create teams which work together and and that's something i mean uh, shardul is aware of it in my entire career i have always had one or two colleagues who are extremely structured thinkers who are you know so i have a colleague of mine with whom i worked not just here we we have unit officers from the same unit in the army and we have worked together in several places now he is a strict stickler for detail and and you know he look at a spreadsheet like this and he'll spot three errors thak 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 like that understands finance understands the nitty gritties <coughs> he complements an area where i'm extremely weak it will be silly on my part to try to become an expert in that area because a i don't have a flair for it second even if i did i it's too late for me to work so hard to get into that space it's far better for me to have a, a relationship with five or six such people that whenever i have an assignment which requires this skill i am able to call those people to assist me in that project rather than trying to replicate or develop a skill which i am not going to be good at as good as this person is mm. so i think that ability to recognize ki ye mera weak area hai ye main nahi kar sakta hu 
करूंगा भी तो इसमें जितनी मेहनत लगेगी इट्स नॉट वर्थ द रिटर्न ऑफ इन्वेस्टमेंट इट्स मच इजियर फॉर मी टू हैंड ओवर कंट्रोल ऑफ दिस एरिया टू समबडी हु अंडरस्टैंड्स दिस मच बेटर इज पैशनेट अबाउट इट इज मच बेटर क्वालिफाइड देन मी इन दिस फार मोर इंटेलिजेंट इन दिस स्पेस आई थिंक दैट एबिलिटी इज समथिंग दैट कम्स यूजली इफ यू डोंट हैव अ फॉर्मल स्ट्रक्चर्ड एजुकेशन वॉट डू यू हैव अ फ्लेफ ऑफ actually as things happen in life usually you find that your weakest things are also your strongest things because you put that much of an effort to not really it's the other way around. so for example I, i by the way when i was in school i was a pretty bad student a very very bad student i used to come first second first second from the bottom of the class <laughs> and a large part of that and you know he's still aware large part of that is that i am never able to remember stuff so i cannot remember long acronyms i can't remember you know 17 points i can't remember six things I, it's very difficult for me i can't remember phone number i think the only phone number i remember is my own number and i don't remember any other number i have a learning disability in that space <coughs> but the same disability gives me the ability to make connections so i can look at the entire picture and say if i took this idea this idea and this idea together and jam them together you will have something completely new mm. so the ability to create or rather a, a friend of mine gave it a term the ability to cross pollinate to take an idea from one place connect it with another one and come up with a solution which is completely different i think it comes from my inability to remember numbers to be good in calculations to do mental math and all of that because i am weak in that area i have the ability to join the dots actually i was just talking to uh myra when we were coming here about this famous story about 3m i don't know if you're aware of it so 3m used to be a glue making company they used to make glues and accidentally in trying to make a super glue which would be able to stick material like metal and metal together <coughs> something went wrong in the formula and the glue became extremely weak so weak that even if you stick it in paper and you stick the paper it will just come off and that's how the 3m post it start <laughs> so the 3m post it started because a glue which was supposed to be very strong turned out to be very weak and it had a completely different application and i think that is true of all human beings all individuals including the ones that are formal education system says are duffers mm. I don't buy that story for the simple reason that by that logic all the 98 percentile people who are uh, completing their MBAs I mean today any even a reasonably tier 2 B school is cutting off at 96% 98% 99% so what happens to the remaining people are they are they are they supposed to lay down and die or are they supposed to say that we will work as uh, you know the subordinates to the mbas <laughs> for the rest but usually in life is the other way around usually in life it's these guys who are employing <laughs> those mm. those people so very clearly i think the educational system uh, also needs a relook it needs a rehaul people need to take a uh, I, i'm not saying i'm not talking about boiling the ocean but i'm saying as an individual i think today if a young person feels that i'm going to attend the mba but i'm not going to be fanatic about it i'll i'll learn over there i'll i'll do some stuff i'll also do you know organize ted programs in my college i'll also participate in some concert i'll also organize some ngo activity and i'll work in the slums with something i think that uh, person is going to grow up to be a far more well rounded person mm. he he will know how to uh, work with different environments different kind of people if you get used to saying that i need all aces in my team to win only then i can win that's an artificial that's not going to happen in real life in mm. real life you're not going to get aces mm. in real life you'll get all sorts of people you'll get people who are intelligent you'll get people who are not intelligent you'll get people who have intelligence in one area and not in another area yeah. you'll get people who are passionate people who are not passionate people who are hungry not hungry yeah. you'll get the cards that you get dealt with and the ability to play with cards which are not like you will usually only come if you have had some of that experience but if you have been always a topper in school always been in an ivy league college and then you land into the real world it might at i have usually found people who have done extreme again i'm talking generally done extremely well in academics very rarely take risks because they got a perfect track record Uh, first divisioner first divisioner gold medalist gold medalist gold so he or she will never take something 
where there is a chance of a silver medal because it will spoil their record. Those people will very rarely take risks and because they will take, very rarely will they take risks, they will not deviate from a beaten path and a beaten path is a beaten path with very little or very less returns. Mm. You want higher returns, you have to take a path which is not beaten. Yeah. You know, you have to take that path and to take that path, usually, I mean, there's a saying that fools will leap where angels fear to tread and of course, it's an extreme example but I've usually found that uh, if you have to do something remarkably different, it does take a, a person who is not in the standard format of education and thinking to do that. Yeah. Uh, so since you had leadership experience in the army and then in the corporate world, uh, something very cool you told me about the army in the last episode was that the training involves a slight shift in your mindset to be able to work as a team, to be able to have some more leadership qualities in each person. So when you're doing that switch into leading in the corporate world and you're finding loose screws and you're finding, you know, people who aren't trained in that same manner that the army people are trained. Uh, what were your discoveries about non-army human beings? Like what are they? <laughs> non-army human beings. <laughs> you're army human beings. Okay. <laughs> like uh, human beings who haven't been through that kind of a grind. So I, I think, you know, this question needs to be uh, taken in some sort of a depth because I can give a shallow answer, which is like, <laughs> you know, the army is different, private sector is different. I think the challenges are different. O on a very human level. As I was saying, environments are different. Okay. They're completely different environments. So you have to understand firstly that, let's say you and I, if you're working in the army together, in six months time, you and I will know everything about each other for the simple reason we are spending 24 by 7 together, except when you are on leave or I am on leave. The rest of the time we are together, I'm seeing you in the officer's mess, you're going up, I am in your pulp and you have no way of avoiding me. So you better, you know, if I'm your senior, you better find a way to work with me, whatever it is. In a corporate, you have a, a set period of time when you are from 9 to 5, you're working and after that you have another world. What is happening in your world? What is happening, you know, in your, very unknown to me. Maybe once in a year we'll meet in some, you know, uh, uh, festival or some raising day or, you know, mm. founder's day or something. But other than that, it's very difficult to really know wh who the real you is. I know your CV story. I don't know your real story. Mm. I have no idea about what your real story. I have, the, I have the story you've told me in your CV. And your CV story is obviously an embellished story. All of us, our CV stories are embellished stories. Because I, buddy, I did this, 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 I did this. But you won't talk about the time where you were betrayed, where you betrayed people, where you have, you know, been uh, in your own eyes, you have not done the right thing and all of that. This only a real friend will know. Now what happens is in the army, that is the kind of camaraderie because physically you are together. You, you are, you're, you, you, in some places, you know each other's body odor mm. because you are in the same bunk for three months or six months together. So you know each and every idiosyncrasy of the person. And you also learn that by and large people are people. There will be some parts which will be good, some parts which will be bad. So there's no such thing as a good person or a bad person. Of course, there's some extreme examples, but by and large people will have good things and bad things and all of that. So you start accepting your teammates for who they are and not for what their CV says they are. Mm. So that's one big difference. The other is that uh, there is some sort of a parity amongst everybody. So if I'm a captain with a certain number of service and you are a captain with a certain number of service, our salaries are going to be dictated by government of India. It doesn't matter jack shit whether you outperform me 10 times, you're not going to get a performance bonus which is higher. So at an economic level, there is a parity. Of course, there are other measures of reward. There's promotion, there is uh, plum postings, there are, um, you know, foreign tours and all of that, which are, you know, other mechanisms of reward. But Financially, there is sort of a parity. So you're not, I, I've very often found, you know, there's a true story. This has actually happened to me. I remember when uh, I was in one of the companies, I was the CEO and uh, one of my senior guys, the annual appraisal came to me. We had a whole chat and all of that. And I said, okay, job well done. And I gave him his uh, envelope for the next year's salary and he opened it and he was delighted because he got uh, a raise that he was not accepting, uh, expecting. And he went out, boss, I was, thanks a ton, you know, I was thinking, but not this much and all that. He had done a good job, you know. He went out and went out. After that, he went out and went out. Why? That guy has got 18 people. Hey, boss, he's got money from your house. He's got money from your house. He's got money from your house. But it's a, it's a relative measurement. So hmm. he's happy with what he's got in an absolute sense. But when compared with a relative sense, there is a certain amount of... So yes, those levers are very different in, in, in the army or in the government for that matter. The levers are different. But I think there are some essences of leadership which are common. And, and I think those essences of leadership uh, are possibly 
more pronounced in the army for the simple reason that you are on duty all the time you know for example i could work in a corporate i'm just making it up but i could work in a corporate and say come to the corporate at nine o'clock in the morning and five o'clock leave nobody really knows who i am after five to next day nine in the morning i mean i could be uh, i could be a drunk i could be a, you know a abusive person i could be whatever in the army you're in a goldfish bowl you're you're living with the troops the troops are watching you all the time so there is no way that you will have to be who you are and that's okay troops are okay with flawed leaders they are not okay with hypocritical leaders that's true in every place mm. in every place people will accept a flawed leader the theek hai yaar mai thodi bahut galtiyan hai but overall banda theek hai but they will never accept a person who puts up a facade and actually is something else which i think there is a lot more scope to do in the corporate world because there are these two worlds so there is it's it's almost possible to do that uh, you know uh, maintain one and not for long obviously you can't do this forever but uh so these are some differences but i think the <coughs> main essence where i would say leadership when it's distilled down whether it's leadership in the army whether it's leadership in a religious institution in a school in a slum in an ngo in a in a charitable institution in uh, anywhere uh some aspects have to be common and the first aspect is a leader has to genuinely care for the troops genuinely care I, i'm not saying molly coddle the troops i'm not even saying that or oh, you have to be you know nice it's like tough parenting a tough parent genuinely cares about them maybe takes the wrong decisions i'm not debating that could be possible that a parent in his or her wisdom insists that no no you have to study engineering and maybe that's a wrong decision but there is no doubting that he has the welfare of the child in mind so i think that's the first criteria that the leader's intention of being looking after the interests of the troops first is got to be very very clear if that is not there uh, whether it is the army the corporate world everywhere people recognize ha satta bolta hai apna he is watching out for himself and he doesn't give a jack shit and unfortunately uh, not just in the corporate but in many many segments yeah, of life so. bulk of the leaders are like that mm. it's it's a sad uh, story. and and i'm not making a, i'm not even pretending that i am not one maybe i am one of them as well so i'm not making any judgment on that but usually you will find that uh, the the number of leaders who genuinely care genuinely care are uh, few and that's why maybe only a few reach that uh, strategic level that's point number 1 point number 2 i think leaders have to be constantly learners they have to constantly keep learning again that is true in the army that is true in the corporate that is true in any successful leadership uh, aspect you have to constantly be learning to be able to ask the right questions you have to be able to ask the right questions is okay but why why can't we do it this way why may we not do it this way i mean and i and i i can tell you this i mean i've worked with some of the leaders whose names you mentioned also a little while ago and i can tell you they find the time to learn i mean and and so anybody who says i don't have the time you can't be busier than a mukesh ambani yeah. or you can't be busier than a bill gates and you are aware of this that each one of these leaders has their own way of constantly learning and updating that otherwise how can a person who is a chemical engineer go on to raise a telecom which beats every other telecom at its game mm. right you can't you can't say i'll just hire good telecom of course you can hire the best telecom people in the world but so can your competition so what gives you that edge that you are able to do it it's the ability to learn an entirely different domain in a very rapid time so you have to be a constant learner the third thing is you also have to be a very good teacher mm. uh, communication i won't just say communication i would say teacher and the, the, the difference between the two huge difference between the two matter of fact we should not confuse the two a good communicator can communicate uh, very well but may teach nothing may choose to teach nothing right a good teacher might actually let an order go but allow the subordinate to learn something i'll i'll give you an example this is one of my ceos who taught me this lesson and i think it's one of the finest lessons i've learned in how to teach and how to mentor uh, he was a uh, commanding officer of mine called subir majumdar and i still remember exactly it's frozen in my head there was a general coming for a briefing very very important man coming for a briefing very senior officer coming for a briefing and he suddenly looked at me and i was a very junior person at that point and i said okay you are going to conduct the briefing Oh, shit 
I was palpitating and I was rehearsing and I was practicing and this and that and he's going to come and the time is also short and I was like I knew ki sab gadbad ho jayega so it can explode and this and that and all of that and I'm literally of course then I said theek hai dekhi jayegi we'll buddy do it I went through the whole thing and just before the presentation was going to start he just indicated to me sit down and he started the presentation uh, one could say the why the hell did you put me through that shit but that was the mentorship he actually put me through the palpitations which is going to happen in a high risk presentation without actually taking the risk of doing that so he made me go through the entire battle inoculation without the actual battle mm-hmm. so the next time i had to do it i would be prepared for it it's a very thoughtful gesture because he could have chosen not to do it at all he could have just said no i'll do the presentation you just help me in which case i switch off completely because if he's going to do it why should i get involved i mean theek hai sir kagaz phagaz laga diya pointer laga diya but beyond that i am not invested in it but the moment he shifted it to me i became invested in it personally and he used that opportunity to train me on that now this is a technique i have followed throughout my career in every meeting that i'll go i'll take one or two youngsters with me for two reasons one is that they sit as a fly on the wall and see what happens in these strategic tables what what are the kind of discussions that are done so that they don't have this off an ivory tower pata nahi wahan pe kaun log baith ke kya sochte hong they realize that they are also human beings they also have feelings they also don't understand many things and you know that jam or that all goes away the second is i'll usually tell them that hey listen i mean ask you to take on at some point that helps them prepare and sometimes of once in a while i ask them also otherwise the thread doesn't hold good so i'll ask them once in a while now these kind of techniques are also techniques of teaching so teaching doesn't just mean i can stand and do a brilliant lecture teaching means how do i find opportunities where i can allow my colleagues or my peers to experience that learning right or or for example i'll often do this that whenever i'm going to hire a strategic hire i will ask three or four people to interview that person and then i'll ask that person okay uh, what is your suggestion it says should we take or not take if so yes why not why now what is happening is that person's rigor is being applied right she is applying the rigor he is applying the rigor i am also getting into the brain and thinking of that individual like mm-hmm. i'll tell you i had a colleague uh, in my last stint you send any person to him for an interview he'll say a fabulous guy <laughs> that's the nature of that person you know <laughs> he he likes to look at every person oh buddy damn good chap he's a very good chap so you will calibrate when so and so says very good you have to calibrate it and bring it down if he says a 9 pointer you have to bring it down to about 6 or 7 because he will always over grade similarly there may be somebody who is extremely cynical or mm. who may have extremely you know uh, uh, parochial views about something right Uh, maybe you have a colleague who has a view that you know uh, women can't work late so if this job requires late working hour i'd prefer a man now this is a mindset that the person has it's important for you to know that mindset it's important for you to know what is the mindset of this person now you can't do a quiz on that person no ki tum batao tumhara mind so how do you do that you do this with creating opportunities where you are able to observe that person's behavior and you say okay when your person is given this situation this is the way the person reacts to that situation that also allows you to understand that person much better and understand that person's thinking much better so if person a comes back and say hey that was a fantastic presentation you say okay it must have been good mm. couldn't have been excellent mm. and person b comes a total uh, fucked it up man they screwed it up he is probably gone good but by his <laughs> calibration he will always give it it's very important to understand that because eventually for a strategic leader you have to use the eyes and minds of other people to make your decisions and eyes and minds of other people are never objective they are always subjective they always add a narrative of that individual so the, like rosh test you see the same rosh picture uh, i'm sure you know that ink blot tests right yeah. so you open the test and if we were administering it to five people five people will see five different stories there that's not the picture the story is in their head the picture is only the trigger mm. so if you have to lead eventually who are you leading you know think about it as a leader who are you le- are you leading the physical form of ranbir are you leading his legs and his arms and his chest or are you leading his mind mm. if you're leading his mind then you have to know the mind no mm. and your mind is very different from his mind is very different your mind is very different from your mind yesterday mm. your mind is very different under pressure your mind is very different in a creative task versus a mechanical task there are some people who will check the 100th line of the excel sheet with the same diligence as the first line 
there are some people after the third line they'll get now if you don't know whom to assign what task even if you have a great team you will actually start messing up yeah. so i think that is what i mean by a teaching leader a teaching leader is always trying to impart whatever knowledge they have to their ecosystem again with a very selfish i'm not saying again not from an altruistic point none of this stuff that i'm telling you is from an altruistic point is from a point of view of becoming a better leader because if you understand how a person is behaving and you are able to impart what you know or what you think in that situation to that person then you are actually force multiplying your capability mm. but if you don't do either of this you don't teach if you say okay okay you know select this guy why but it's like this guy that person has no idea of where she went wrong what can be recalibrated where is the alignment mismatch and stuff like that so i'll go back to the three fundamentals genuine genuine interest in the teams that you're leading that they must do well and that they must doing well is not necessarily you give them a raise in the salary it could just be like i remember in reliance i embarked on a program which was basically to make sure that every officer who was working in that group the the knowledge level was enhanced they they would become better people in terms of general education general knowledge better communicators we had an internal exam in reliance called the caps it's the career accelerated program which anybody after 4 years or 3 years of service can write and it puts you on a accelerated track mm. and this whole initiative of literally compelling people that hey we have to give this exam you have to give this like a civil service sabko dena padega ye and the number of people who cleared that it shows you that the talent was already there it just needed that stimuli and that's the job of a leader yeah. the job of a leader is to s- provide that stimuli that compels an individual to go beyond a limit that has been imposed by themselves usually that Im- limit has been imposed by other people mm. somebody else has told you are hey, this is good enough for you this is good yaar you're very good chap you are in this level it's fantastic but if you actually compel them to try an attempt which is much bigger and they actually make it, it you're building their confidence you're building better you're building a better version of that person which i think is the primary job of every leader second as i told you you have to be learning constantly you have to be constantly learning it can be technology it can be new concepts it can be a different way like the podcast that you i i watch that pod i may not connect with that podcast but i need to watch it why does it have 4 million views mm. so what is it that is uh, attracting these four, who are these 4 million people and why are they listening to this and what am i missing out of that you know you can't say badi bakwas hai i don't like it so it's bakwas it's not if it's got 4 million views which is twice the number of views that any one of my talks has got mm. then very clearly either they have some formula or some audience or something that i need to learn from and the last point is that if you constantly keep teaching one it reinforces that knowledge in your own head secondly you are building a more enriched team and you are building also a very uh, vibrant culture where yeah. people share knowledge and say ha ye bataya kaise kar ye le le take this it's there we have done this successfully take it from us mm. you know rather than holding knowledge mm. you know we have been trained actually unfortunately our education system trains us to hold knowledge yeah. that's why kids are taught how to write an exam first cover your creation <laughs> then create you train them like this for 20 years and one day you tell them collaborate how can they collaborate mm. they've been trained to hold knowledge inside them mm. i think these three traits i have found are common the, the, the good leaders have it in bureaucracy they have it in army they have it in Sport. corporates they have it in sports uh, some of the greatest leaders in sports actually make the players shine much better than them yeah right? donny is a, Dhoni great, is a example. great example when when he's there in the field everyone feels that i can operate at my very best some other captain may actually bring a sense of fear into the day now we are they so anybody i mean there's a very famous uh, statement made who is a powerful leader a powerful leader is one in whose room when you enter and come out you feel powerful you feel energetic a powerless leader is one in whose room if you go you're scared and when you come out you are like half of what you were earlier so the idea of power is different a powerful leader is one who gives people the feeling that they have become more powerful a powerless leader takes away that power from people a lot of people think it's the other way around ki yeah. aise dar lagta hai to ye powerful leader hoga nahi wo powerless leader hai agar aap usko dar lagta hai uske office mein jaane se ghabrate ho ki pata nahi kya sawal puchega ye puch lega to main kya jawab dunga then he is a powerless leader but if you feel ki ha chalo danda vanda marta hai beech beech mein but 
सीखने को मिलेगा विल टेक मी टू द नेक्स्ट लेवल विल विल यू नो जेन्यनली वॉच आउट फॉर माई इंटरेस्ट देन दैट इज अ पावरफुल लीडर सो आई थिंक दैट दीज दीज थ्री ट्रेड्स आई फाउंड कॉमन अक्रॉस ऑल द थ्री डोमेन्स दैट आई हैव वर्क एंड ऑल्सो सीन अदर पीपल सर कमिंग बैक टू योर स्टोरी Uh, you had one very interesting evolution right after i think your mahindra stint um, and your initial corporate and i feel your corporate career was divided into two parts and the middle of that you worked with the government also on a project so i know you can't talk about it too much on a public podcast like this but in whatever capacity you can i'd love to hear it from your mouth and also share it with my listeners and all even if you can't share what you did exactly if you could share some learnings from that stint of your life So obviously I can't share what I did there. I mean, it's still uh, it's uh, it's a classified project, and in the interest of uh, us as a country, it, it's not, and it's not really important what I did there. What is more important is that I think for a country like India, we must start understanding the concept. So I'll, let me take a project like Aadhaar, which is more talkable, and it happened at the same time, and I was quite you know you know involved in that also, and of course. Uh, Nandan, who was heading it at that point of time, was also kind of a mentor in many other ways. So, uh, we have to, as a country, start looking at leveraging our national capacity, not government capacity, not private sector capacity, but national capacity. So, what does national capacity mean? The so national capacity is the government, the private sector, the citizens, individuals, all working together towards the same mission. Because increasingly. problems of our country are going to be complex and multidimensional and multi stakeholder for instance to understand a uh, 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 politician's dilemma let's say a political leader's dilemma suppose you are asked how do you improve the health of a country like india now there is no one single thrust line you do you need more doctors of course you need more doctors more nurses yeah you need more nurses but you also need hygiene you also need a clean sewer disposal you also need clean air you need to give education to mothers to have the proper nutrition you need to give inoculation to the babies you need to make sure that there is a you know a post delivery care this thing you have to be early so it is a multifunctional and multi stakeholder activity which has to work in conjunction with each other just by providing more doctors is not going to solve the problem mm. like we realize in covid just by providing ventilators how are you going to make for the shortfall of the doctors for shortfall of the doctors you'll have got to go back 15 years no mm. you have to train a doctor have him have five years experience then internship then the all so you suddenly realize that when you are trying to solve national problems you need to leverage national capacity now the national capacity can come from various different segments uh, matter of fact most complex problems in the world whether is the taming of the atom the manhattan project or even uh, major major things that uh, nations have done it has happened as a collaboration between several entities which included the government the private sector the private citizens they all worked together now fortunately uh, or unfortunately whichever way you want to look at it in countries like the us the uk europe this has already been done several times during the first and the second world war so in the second world war or in the case of us even in vietnam it's a very common thing for a lot of the military who worked in the military to come into the corporate world and then work in the corporate world and then come to a decision point where they have to take a decision on the military and they have an understanding because they have been there so a lot of the european leaders uh, or even american leaders corporate leaders have had a stint in the forces in the earlier decades that i'm so they understand that uh, government Uh, private partnerships are not very adversarial in india to a certain extent they are still adversarial it's seen as a, a private sector ka aadmi hai a sarkar ka aadmi hai so there is that almost like a chinese wall between these two entities and for whatever reasons valid reasons on both sides maybe the government thinks that you know a lot of people in the corporate sector are corrupt and that could be a thinking a lot of people in the corporate sector think a government wale kaam nahi karte hain they are very lethargic and both are wrong both are wrong i think government uh, servants uh, if you look at their hours of working and more importantly their uh, responsibility it is un unimagin- i mean incomparable because if you are working in the private sector and let's say you screw up at the worst you lose your job you do the same thing in the government the cbi could come after you because they may say that this was a clear cut uh, intentional so whatever so the stakes at which they are working the environment in which they are working is very different now i think both these worlds need to understand and work together because mm. if any nation has to look at solving complex problems 
you know there, there's a friend of mine who actually runs a session with cfos and she puts them into three different groups you know she says okay you are all bureaucrats and government servants and you are ngos and activists and you are the corporate sector and then she asks each demography what do you think about them so the government uh, thinks oh the private sector guys they are all very always capitalized money they only want money they want to make more money you give them any license they will try to make profitably out of it if you don't regulate the prices they will shoot the prices of medicines up and ye bo phalana dim kara you ask the corporate people they say kuch kaam nahi hai license raj hai for everything you need permission iska permission uska permission to open a business you need 200 permission this that they have no understanding of our business they don't understand technology they'll put some rule which will be completely got what do you think about the ngo oh, activists they don't allow any project to start there nothing to start did that now now is the same group of people the same group of cfos when they wear a hat of the other side they have an adversarial relationship but guess what for any project to happen if you want to increase jobs in maharashtra you need to provide maybe a port new port has to come uh, 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 if you build a port uh, that will provide jobs to 10000 people will also maybe kill 10000 ridley turtles that's mm-hmm. also important the ridley turtles die they are the precursor of the nature getting destroyed so that's also important this is also important so you suddenly realize that in a country like india you are always going to have a solution which is a satis- satisfying solution it is satisfactory and efficient it is never going to be super efficient on a scale of 1 to 10 you will never have a, it's like designing a menu for 100 people nobody will be satisfied more than 60% नॉन वेज वाला बोलेगा कि मीट ज़्यादा नहीं था वेज बोलेगा बहुत ज़्यादा मीट था मीठा नहीं था सो एवरी वन विल हैव अ सिक्स आउट ऑफ टेन रेटिंग एंड दैट्स द बेस्ट थिंग यू कैन डू इन अ कॉम्प्लेक्स कंट्री एंड अ कॉम्प्लेक्स प्रॉब्लम सो द एबिलिटी टू लेवरेज नेशनल कैपेसिटी इज समथिंग दैट आई थिंक इंडिया शुड रियली रियली वर्क एट इन एन एक्सेलरेटेड प्लेटफॉर्म and there are some very basic reasons for it the reasons for it is that when the like i'm taking a very simple example i'm simplifying this example but i think it's to illustrate a point let's say the civil services in 1990 uh, decided that we need 150 ias officers because these are the portfolios 1990 they could not visualize that you will need creative arts you will need internet uh, traffic uh, monitoring you need this that and so there's no way to even envisage a vacancy hmm. that will be required now if you have to position someone in that vacancy who needs that domain strength you have to bring that person laterally they, you cannot you cannot tell a person who has been a ias officer he is a general leader he is a general officer but he doesn't understand that particular domain or that particular technology so i think this interweaving of national capacity uh, is something that a country like india should really embark on as a program uh, in every government it has been attempted it has been attempted and like many of such projects uh, it starts and then it has some success and then it uh, Uh, but i think this is an area that uh, we that was one of the biggest learnings that we should do more of it should get one we should do not only more of it we should have a much much better understanding of each other's lives and uh, you know for i mean i never had that notion in my head because i have worked with the government in my previous corporate of tars also uh, i worked with mha very closely earlier and uh, with but for all my friends who often comment that you know bureaucrats don't work wo to kaam nahi karte kuch kaam nahi karte it's such a sweeping inaccurate statement you know i still tell people about my first day in mha when i joined uh, that time mr gopal pillai was the home secretary and uh, so you know the first day i joined i was filling out the papers this that all of those things and i was sitting in the waiting room and i sat there and it was like 7 o'clock then it was 7:30 then it was 8 o'clock I didn't know what to do it was my first day so I kind of asked the PS of the home secretary that any instructions for me or so he said oh sir you're sitting here I'll just check with the home secretary he must have called up so immediately the home secretary called me inside I said you're still here sitting here I said so but I did not know what to do so I was kind of sitting here so he said no 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 you go and come back tomorrow morning and then we'll start and you go please go home and all so by that time it was about 9 o'clock So I just uh, asked him very casually. I said, uh, "Sir, is this the normal working time till nine o'clock?" He said, "No, no, 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 no. Only when there is a crisis." And then when I was going out of the room, he again called out and he said, "In the home ministry, every day is a crisis." Mm. And that's when you realize that people 
who work under government constraints they are actually it's like pushing a string it's not like pulling a string there are so many processes that have to be adhered to because it's mm -hmm. public money because there is compliance because it's not a, a, a set ki company that you know somebody can write off a loss and those kind of things so i think once you understand the constraints in which someone is working you will be far more appreciative of the progress that has been made in that space mm. of course that doesn't absolve people in this field or that field or that field who are shirkers who are corrupt i'm not talking about that but i'm saying this understanding of each other's domains and understanding of each other where they are coming from uh, I, 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 during my tenure in that grid i may have had very adversarial relationship with one or two of my colleagues uh with one colleague i remember very adversarial relationship but what that man taught me about even the basics of is something as rudimentary as vastu and what are the deep scientific principle behind it or his ability to grasp extraordinarily complex things in in a fraction of time which sent a new benchmark for me in terms of learning mm -hmm. these are all learnings that you take away from from different domains so i think my learning has been that if we have to solve complex problems national problems are very complex they are not one order of thinking there are 18 orders of thinking ye karunga to uska asar ye hoga uska asar ye hoga uska asar that requires intense collaboration from different stakeholders who cannot afford to be adversarial mm. uh, because the the problem that we are trying to solve is much much bigger than mm. our adversarial environment so are you uh, <laughs> okay explaining what the nat grid is but in words that can be understood by a 10 year old so i can explain it to you uh, from public information whatever is there in the public information that sure. uh, it's there on wikipedia it will tell you think of uh, that uh, institution as a, a library catalog a library catalog so let's say you are a student of history and you want to uh, you want a book on you want knowledge on ancient history of india and you go to this catalog so the librarian will first ask you ancient history of india is too big why don't you tell us now okay from the gupta period to okay fine gupta period there are four books that have been written on it one is in the bangalore library one is in mumbai university one is in a private collection with somebody and one is over here this is the gist of the content uh, at your seniority you are authorized to see only these things and if you want the book the book is with them we'll make the connection happen so this is in a nutshell what uh any information exchange system is supposed to do mm. which is supposed to uh, redirect the information seeking query to the right place where it is and of course also in some cases to fuse the data together to take data from two or three areas and to make the sharing of um, data i won't even call it intelligence but data much easier so this is the charter of uh, pretty much every fusion center in the world not just uh, the nat grid every fusion center in the world this is the fundamental charter to help pick out a needle in a haystack of needles the purpose of it is to better what aspect of the national security national security and and very specifically oriented towards counter terror at least this was my knowledge 6 years ago and of course after 6 years i have no knowledge of uh, and and institutions evolve they change they change mm. their dna they change their uh, motive mandates mm. and i think uh, that's what it was meant for so sir from working with the government i'm going to ask you a very direct question to bring you back to the corporate side of things what did mr mukesh ambani see in you and think to himself that okay i need this person now that you have to ask mr mukesh ambani <laughs> I, i i have i, I cannot answer what, that what, question from your point of view uh, what I, I i have known mukesh bhai for many years i have known him from the time when i used to work with the mahindra group i have always uh, admired uh, certain qualities in him and uh, when i left the government uh, as an individual he is the kind of a person who like anand has i think uh, he knows his mind when he he wants a certain kind of a uh, uh, talent to come in into the family what 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 did you learn about him like after you met him you know like what's the difference between your version of him before you met him versus no, of course uh, when you work with a leader closely and uh, and i don't pretend that i was you know part of his inner circle or anything of that sort but the portfolio i held was sufficiently sensitive Uh, for me to be able to observe him from very closely and i think uh, 
uh, I mean, not just him, but I would say his father, because a lot of the things that you see in that empire are the foundations laid by the father. And of course, he has taken it to another level altogether. But I think uh, if I were to pick one quality in him as a leader or as an individual, it's his incredible uh, ability to envision things uh, way, way ahead of uh, the rest of us. Uh, I often quote this incident. Uh, it's, it's more of an internal incident and I had, I'm quoting it here because I wrote it in my farewell mail. When I was leaving, I wrote this incident as one of my experiences that I've had with him. So, uh, in the early days when I joined, at that point of time, we had, uh, uh, I, I think Reliance as a corporate probably is the owner and custodians of the largest number of CCTV cameras in the corporate world, definitely. Um, I don't know how many millions we probably have because every store, every refinery, every location, it's pipelines, all of these things. <clears throat> so, this was that time when drones were, you know, starting to come in and there was talk of using drones for aerial surveillance and you know use the drone so you can do away with hundreds of cameras if you have one drone which is you know sort of overseeing that <clears throat> so we had put together some plans and i remember going to his office uh, to discuss that with him and you know I'd, i was talking to him about the drones and also as soon as i began telling him about drones and you know this is why we are doing it to replace the cameras blah 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 all of that he, he was, he said, one minute, one minute, and he was started rummaging in his desk somewhere, and from below his shelf, he pulled out a sheet of paper, and he named a person, who doesn't really matter, but, but it's a person from Blackstone, uh, one of these uh, financial companies, and he said that, you know, he was here last week, and he said, this satellite is <laughs> let's buy a satellite. Now, coming from any other business leader, <clears throat> I would take that with a pinch of salt, but from him, it's quite plausible. So when I was thinking that I'm thinking at a macro view of instead of CCTV camera, I'm thinking of a drone, he's thinking of satellite. Mm. And I think that distance very clearly, I mean, this distance shows uh, that one unique trait he has, the ability to envision something which is uh, so huge and so large that the rest of us may not even think in, in those lines. And that I think is a a remarkable trait and I think every country needs a few of such leaders because it's these leaders who are able to pole vault and, and uh, take, I mean, the digital revolution in India today. Every uh, person having access to at least content, uh, you know, and the content may be crap. That's not his fault or <laughs> anybody's fault. And I'm sure the content will now fill in that space. But access to content, I think, uh, has been exceptional it, it is it is it's something that uh, like i said when history of india is written this period when suddenly overnight everyone got access to unfettered access to tons of content is i think uh, uh, it, it will be a huge contribution to, to every indian and every next generation i think that's huge very important for <coughs> all the youtubers lives also not just youtubers live but you know i mean i'm i'm Fascinating. You are one of the examples, but <clears throat> like when I see some woman sitting somewhere in Bhopal and has six million followers when she teaches how to uh, stitch a blouse, I'm just thinking of the relevance that woman must have had in her life. You know, mm. this is one skill of teaching how to stitch a blouse, and suddenly it's. I'm not saying she became a celebrity, but she became relevant. She, she is now an entity, an identity on her own. I mean, mm. for you, perhaps it's not that big a difference. Mm. You, you are born in the right place. You are a right family. Even if you did not have YouTube access or you were not a YouTuber, you still would have had relevance. But the ability to take a person who is sitting in the back of beyond Kashmir and uh, or, or some remote area in Northeast from there is able to have connectivity. Kashmir is the wrong example in current times, but in the Northeast or in the remote areas and have the same amount of connectivity that a city kid has uh, or similar to that extent. I think that's a revolution. People haven't really grasped it even now. They mm. think, oh, guys, have YouTube mil gaya. It's not YouTube mil gaya. You've got, you've got access to resources which was only for a privileged few. Mm. Uh, he has, I, I think the right way to put it is he has mainstreamed the future. Yeah, yeah. He has actually mainstreamed the future. He has yeah. made the future mainstream. Yeah. And I think that 
definitely is, uh, is something which sets him apart from many other leaders I've worked with and seen also very closely. What about the whole organization? I mean, if you've worked <laughs> across corporates, what is, uh, on, on a very foundation and culture level, what has allowed Reliance to break out from the rest of the pack? Because I'm sure there's a lot of ambition amongst the rest of the pack as well, but there must be something culturally correct done here to allow that rocket launch. Well, frankly, I, I don't think I'm qualified to comment on a question that big. I think every company, every organization has their own culture. They have their own DNA. They have their own operating system and they have their own way of operating within the larger operating system. So these four or five parameters define every organization's path. And of course, organizations also, like human beings, have a lifetime. Just like human beings, they are born just like human beings, they have a young age, uh, like human beings, they have adolescence, then they have maturity. And unfortunately, like human beings, they do become old. And when they become old, they do become, uh, you know, arthritic and they also die. Uh, I, I, I won't take any particular example, but let's talk about the recent phenomenon that we have all seen that a company called Zoom comes out of nowhere and overtakes Skype, WhatsApp, Face, Page, FaceTime, Shacetime, Cisco, WebEx, Google, Hangout, all of them and overtakes them to become a $100 billion valuation. Why does that happen? Doesn't Facebook know FaceTime? Doesn't WhatsApp know how to do video conferencing? Doesn't WebEx, Cisco, which had the original telepresence, don't they know how to do that? But why were they not able to leverage it? So it's also where the company is in its horizon in time in terms of its agility in terms of its flexibility in terms of its size so many things come into play so to take any one aspect and say that this aspect is what made this company happen is a wrong thing to do because a it is inaccurate it's always a combination of factors b just because company a did it company b may not be able to do it because that is that company's core competence mm -hmm. company b may not have that core competence their staffing may not be done in that way uh, a, a company, if the culture of a company is having one centralized command and subservient leaders, then their staffing is done in that way. The aspiration of their leaders is validation from that central source. Whereas another company may have a requirement of having multiple leaders. Let's take a company like uh, PepsiCo. They have multiple uh, brands and multiple franchises. They need multiple independent leaders. Their staffing will be done in a very different way. There the reward mechanism is not necessarily a pat on the back from the main person at top, but pat on the back from the market or whatever. So it's unfair or incorrect diagnosis. It's just like your physical health. You can't uh, prescribe the same diet to two different people mm. and say what works for a... Olympic athlete, an Olympic athlete consumes 8,000 calories a day. You do that, you'll explode in mm. eight days. So mm. it's, it's basically what works for a certain entity. Uh, I think uh, that group or Mahindra or Birla or Tata or any one of these groups have found that ideal combination which works for them, which works for their partners, which also works for the expectation of the stakeholders. A stakeholder will expect certain things from a certain company or a certain brand they will not expect the same things from another company and another brand so the brand and the company are meeting the promise mm. it doesn't mean they have to be exactly the same they will not be the same they will be very different but each one will find success in their own way but at its core a company is a collection of people <laughs> so one thing i've seen at least from the outside and i've been a part of like the reliance group of people because my my schooling was at the Dhirubhai International School. So there is an element of that reliance culture even in the school. Uh, the way I look at it, I think it's very um, person oriented as in like a lot of people are elevated to positions of uh, command. And I also feel that there's a deep family culture. And you also see that in things like Mumbai Indians where they keep retaining like the old guard. Uh, so is it that they reward long term players within the organization? Is there some kind of cultural thing from a people leadership perspective? <clears throat> I'll answer this question in a different way. Sure. <clears throat> Let's say you have a driver whose driving capability in a scale of 1 to 10 is 7. But his trustworthiness is in a scale of 1 to 10, 9. 
another driver you have whose driving skills in a scale of 1 to 10 is a 9 but trustworthiness in other than driving because he's just joined you is maybe 3 or 4 you have two tasks one task is that you have to rush to the airport to catch a flight and it's really really critical that you have to catch the flight the other task is you need to send uh, 5 lakhs in cash to your friend in Mumbai or in Pune who desperately needs it. How are you going to make the selections? Mm. Right? Now, to deliver the cash, you will take a person whose driving skills may be 7, but trustworthiness is 9. So, 7 into 9 is equal to? 63. 63. In the other case, the person's driving skill is 9, trustworthiness is 4. 4 into 9 is equal to? 36. So, when it's a choice between 63 and 36, the choice is very clear. Mm. Right? So, any leader would rather have a person who they trust, who they feel aligns with them and is competent enough to do the job than to have competence which is very high but alignment and trust may not be that high. Mm. Now, both for alignment and trust, time is a factor. Because there is no way I can come and tell you, say, sir, trust me, I'm a very trustworthy person. I have to be with you for a certain number of years before that trustworthiness you accept. I may be still a trustworthy person. I may be 100% trustworthy. But for you to feel that comfort, that yes, I can trust, is a different ballgame. And therefore, in certain organizations, whether it's Reliance or many other organizations, which are uh, much more family-oriented, which are much more people oriented uh, and it's a very people oriented uh, organization i think uh, the way they go out of the way if somebody falls ill even during this covid show it i mean they airlifted doctors from all over the world to make sure that every place had that kind of you know personal you know kind of a uh, it's care, a very care for our people care apna family apna hai apna mm. hai to, you have to take care that uh, is a very different uh, from a antiseptic MNC kind of uh, uh, behavior where you are just, uh, you know, C grade, uh, uh, PAPE grade 24. That's it. And maybe you have few colleagues, but you are never ever, uh, 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 there is no such thing as a, a family, you know, in, in that sense. Different DNAs, different requirement, different kind of people. Uh, uh, one is not better than the other, just different. It's, it's like saying a Gujarati thali and a Maharashtrian thali, which is better. There is no mm. such thing as better. They're just different. They're completely different. And I think we have to understand that. So that is definitely uh, one of their uh, DNAs. And at the end of the day, you always have to look at the outcome. I think an organization's efficiency has to be measured by the outcome. Mm. A company that is outperforming the market, a company that is growing year on year outcome, it does show that it is doing uh, the right thing. Some things are being done right. And that is the way to look at it. I got my answer. So now that you've answered all my corporate questions yeah. and all my story ways questions, I got to talk to you about life mm. and uh, <laughs> the future. And this is coming from all the perspectives of your army tenure plus your corporate tenure plus. I feel you've always been at that stage where you've been a learner and it's just become even more fierce for you, that process of learning as you've grown. And I'm saying that from a place of knowing you behind the camera as well. Yeah, like you're always sure. reading and all that. So, uh, what do the next 20 years hold for you? And I know that you think of like uh, m the present more than you think of the future. But still, if I had to ask you what would give you joy over the next 20 years, how would you answer that? After uh, having accumulated all this I, I have to tell you, honestly, Ranbir, I wish I knew the answer to that question. Okay. I genuinely wish I knew the answer to that question. And there are two reasons for it. Uh, one reason is uh, my life has been, this is not about my career and my my life. I think I said it in the first po podcast also. I don't think I've ever, you know, had this structured view of life and life. If somebody were to ask me, how did this all happen? I'll say it was a lot of serendipity, a lot of being at the right place at the right time or a lot of, I don't know, good karma by other people, whatever you want to call it. It's It's been there. And in, to a certain extent, I believe, this is my belief, I'm not asking anyone else to believe it, but I believe that the check marks that a person should have, at least in the professional side, I have a sense that most of those check marks, I have done it. I mean, to my satisfaction, I have done it. Yeah, I mean, and you know, for a lot of young men especially, I can't speak for women because I'm not a woman myself, but for a lot of young men, having those professional check marks becomes the game you create for yourself. Of course it is. It's, it is. So this is that whole theory of an external scorecard versus an internal scorecard. So 
an external scorecard is handed over to you when you are born even for women when you are born a external so so you if you go to this school it's good if you get science after 10th it's good in science if you get into a medical college or an engineering college it's good if you get selected by uh, the big four in your first this thing in your first day of placement it is good if you have given a dollar paid job in hong kong it's better than being paid a rupee paid job in pune that's good so you constantly are being told that this is good and therefore you should be happy and that's maybe true for an external scorecard but at some point in time you will arrive at life at somewhere you will arrive and then and you can arrive it at various stages also where you will realize that i don't really feel good just because i have this i mean you are saying it's good you are saying it's good you are saying it's good it's like you know <laughs> this story many many years ago when i was a kid as a family outing we had gone to a place in karol bag and in karol bag there was a very famous kulfi shop so i don't know if you have had that kulfi which is inside that metal yeah. you know with a stick yeah. in it a very famous shop so people come there from so they everyone everyone's given a kulfi and this is the first time i'm having a kulfi you know i'm told that this is a delicacy and all of that now what had happened is as you are aware this ice they when they put the kulfi they also put salt in the ice so in this particular thing there was some seal ka issue the seal had broken and full of salt so when i was eating it was like completely salty and i was wondering everyone else is saying this is very good very good very good so finally i told my mom i don't want this no oh, but it's very it's very salty so she tasted it and she told that man and that guy was astounded he was astounded that i ate like 70% of it you know and he asked, I, i said sab log bol rahe acha acha so i thought it was good in life we often eat kulfis like that you know mm. because others have told us it is good so we eat it and when we say yaar it might must be good if i am you know working for this uh, mnc it if i am earning so many uh, lakhs it must be good i'm not so sure that that score card you want to run with for the rest of your life of course you need to run with it for a certain point of time because you need the financial security you need to bring up your family educate your kids and all that but when you come to a point where this external score card is continuously driving you I think you have to start asking those fundamental questions. That is this the scorecard which is my scorecard, or is it a scorecard which has been given to me by my parents, by my colleagues, by my friends, by others? And if it is their scorecard, then am I living my hundred percent life? So it's a very interesting analogy. So let's say a person who loves you most in the world, and for sake of argument, let's make it your mother. You know, so it's easier to imagine that, or my mother, or whatever. Now, even the person who loves you most in the world has only twenty percent of the mind share for you, because twenty percent she has to keep for your other siblings, twenty percent for her husband, twenty percent for her own knee problem, ye arthritis. So the person who loves you the most in the world has only twenty percent of mind share for you. Why the hell would you live your hundred percent of your life for that twenty percent? So I think somewhere people need to calibrate that scorecard. And again, I I don't think it's age. Uh, I mean, I know. young students uh, mba students who got a very lucrative career ahead of them but choosing to join an ngo and saying you know what i want to work in an ngo because this is my scorecard i i find happiness there i see that a lot happening in in the in the in the current generation i don't think our generation or at least at that point of time that financial strata had that luxury mm. to say okay you know i'll do it was very very fixed that you had to you had to start working by a, a certain period of time so i think this uh, understanding this difference between an external and internal scorecard is the first transition that i think i am going through right now and secondly if i look back at my life i always say that i have always had a posting order come to me you know it's almost like the army one day a uh, posting order will arrive in the mail and say you are now posted to so and so place and that's the way my life has been so if somebody asked me in 1993 uh, i would have never imagined that i would be out of the army if somebody asked me in 19 or maybe in 2006 or 7 i would have never imagined that i would go back into the government mm. uh, if somebody asked me in 2013 i would have never imagined i would leave the government so i think uh, these posting orders life has a, a a tendency to send them to you once in a while and uh, while you wait for the posting order you wait in holding pattern and mm-hmm. in holding pattern you basically try and acquire skills and and uh, knowledge knowledge and even points of view which you may not have had earlier or may not have had the need to have earlier yeah. and uh, i guess that's where i am right so i would i don't know i mean i could uh, i often joke about it that if you asked me where i was going to be 3 years from now 
and gave me 15 options what would eventually happen would be 118th so <laughs> i have no idea i <laughs> mean yeah. so but like they say that the the good part is to focus on your battle drills mm. so it doesn't really matter then which battle you have to fight if your battle drills are good then by and large you'll you'll find your way out of that so i guess that's where it is yeah 20 years is a very long time you don't <laughs> know what's going to happen in 2 years did you know covid was going to happen no so no <laughs> 20 years is a very very long time i'd yeah. say that long term planning nowadays should be about 18 months to 2 years <laughs> that should be long term planning yeah just just so that the viewers get some context on um, <clears throat> this podcast i just want to add one story of mine uh, right here we actually 2 years back we were thinking of stopping our english channel completely mm. because it was becoming extremely difficult to balance a hindi channel as well as an english channel and i sat down with my core team like my original team and i told them this is what i want to do and i think i should go hammer and tongs on the mass game and not the class game they asked me what's the easiest form of content you can do mm. so i said i can call smart people and just talk to them mm. and that was why the podcast started like it was just that because it was extremely easy to do now um mm. to one one year in one and a half years in this is the fuel of my life and we started a hindi podcast has become the main source of content we are known as the number one podcast in the country mm. and things like that mm. but just landed up here mm. uh and you know the other aspect of things is i feel this whole year has gone in podcasting i actually survived uh, the covid pandemic from a content perspective because we were podcast no so let's say i mean whether it's covid or any other op- you know constraint constraint is what fuels the opportunity yeah. you know when the constraint comes around you all all great technologies i mean look at it this way india we built our own super computer called param mm. because the us refused to give us cray super computers in the 70s because they said you will use it for alternate uses for military and nuclear and all that we bent on to become one of the leading missile development programs in the world satellite launching and all of that because the russians refused to give us cyrogenic technology we still haven't been able to make a good rifle because rifles we still buy mm. so when you are denied something you have to find a way out of it and that is where ingenuity comes in yeah. innovation comes in so any time a constraint is placed it always will spawn some completely new kind of a, a thinking a new kind of a i think that way i mean i'm, I'm not talking of course it has brought a lot of misery and lot of uh, heartbreak and lot of sadness to a lot of people but i think the pandemic itself has altered in many ways and opened up avenues yeah. for people to really look 100%. at uh, you know how how to roll yeah. out their uh, plans for the future yeah i think that's my definition of life at age 27 that mm-hmm. as long as you keep trying you keep learning you keep mm-hmm. gaining new perspectives life kind of nudges you into the directions you're always meant to be in i think so too and uh, i mean as radhika mentioned in her talk also i think eventually it all ties up together these bricks that are laid as obstacles and in a way these obstacles opportunities bricks and stones and uh, uh, opportunity that you were supposed to get was taken away from you and you were sent into some other place i think in the larger scheme of things these all pieces fall together and maybe when you look back i mean i have had this incident in my life and uh, I remember there was a certain portfolio I was holding I don't want to name what it was uh, during my corporate tenure and I was literally a uh, lot of organizational politics and literally compelled out of that portfolio uh, but because it was I was com- uh, you know moved out of that portfolio is the reason why I did something else is the reason why something mm-hmm. else happened and is the reason why I finally went on to raise the national intelligence grid and i met that individual uh, many years later who actually caused this you know i'm much older person and all and i went to thank him and i genuinely went to thank him i genuinely <laughs> thanked him that if you are not and he said nahi beta aap to bura man aap samajh nahi rahe hain i am actually thanking you you're not getting it so i think these instances these these things that come into your life they they create you for an opportunity or for the ability to deliver Uh, opportunity which life will present to you uh, it's actually very easy to look at it in the hindsight it's very easy to look in the hindsight and say you know that difficulty which i had that tragedy which i had that opportunity that i was overlooked for that thing that i missed is the reason why i am in this place today right the problem is when you're going through it now the ability to tell yourself now 
that now what I am going through, it may be bad, it may be sadness, it may be depression, it may be mental health issues, it could be anything. It is for the good. I mean, it's a cliched sentence that everything happens for the best. But it is true. Now, the trick is the ability to recognize it while you're going through the bad stuff. And having that resolve to say, okay, it is happening for a reason, it will happen for a few more weeks, for a few more months and all. But when it ends, it will be a very necessary part of my ability to do something in the future. If I had not gone through this trauma, this sadness or whatever, I would not have been able to do this. I mean, I've heard this, I'm sure you have heard it from several people. I've heard it from a, a, a very close friend of mine who is blind, who now say, lost his eyesight. And he says that losing my eyesight was what enabled me to see the world in a different way. I can't even imagine a person who's become, who's lost one of the most important senses being able to say that. But he's actually covered that journey mm -hmm. and he's able to say that. So I think in hindsight, it's easy. When I look back at my, or you look back in your 27 years of some failure you had, some heartbreak you had, and you say it was good I had it because because of that I have this now. It is if you were to go through it today, uh, how do you deal with it? Are you able to say, you it's okay. That is really the challenge. And it's nice to say it in a podcast, but if I were to break a leg outside, it'll be very difficult for me to convince myself it's happening for the best. Because during that time, you're hurting. And when you're hurting, it's very difficult to have a perspective which is... Uh, Two years ahead. Uh, no, I don't know. Yeah, because you're hurting right now. <laughs> and you want this pain to stop now. And, and you, are, you are unwilling to be seduced by any temptation of what this pain will bring to you as a gain two years from now. But that is the cycle of life. I think we all have a, a, a certain amount of bad luck and good luck written. And, and that bad luck has to play out. It has to, you can't avoid it. It's just, it's going to be there. So, and the final question of this podcast is not exactly about the pandemic, but sort of a pandemic that I feel an entire generation is dealing with. It's called mental health issues. Uh, I primarily feel it's because of social media and hyper connectivity. I don't know whether we spoke about it in this episode or the Hindi podcast, but we've spoken about this, that yeah. too connected, there's an overload of information, which has probably increased the number of mental health issues, especially when you compare it to say 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So uh, have you seen this from your leadership positions in corporate? I, I think it's, it's going to be one of the biggest problems that uh, not corporate India, but India will face. And I'll tell you the reason why I think India will face because as we are aware, India's bulk of the population is very young and it's going to be young for some time. Matter of fact, I think firstly we have to understand this mental health is a wrong phrase because mental health is a mother-all catch-all phrase. I don't think that's the right phrase to use. The right phrase is a psychologically unsafe environment. Okay. Uh, I think the environment that the youth and the younger kids are growing in today and even adults to a certain extent is psychologically very unsafe. I'll explain what that means. Uh, a psychologically safe environment is one in which you feel you can speak your mind. You feel that if you say something, no one will get hurt. No one will get upset. And that's the environment that you need in organizations where you need creativity and innovation and new ideas bursting. You, you cannot have a punitive environment that if you say something wrong, you'll be penalized. If you do something wrong, you'll be penalized. Ironically, contrary to your belief, this psychologically unsafe state is happening because of losing connections, not because of increased connections. It's true, we have many, many Facebook and YouTube and Twitter followers. I think you have a few million or whatever. But how many of them are really friends of yours? They're not really friends. They're not friends. Friends maybe you'll be lucky. Any person will be lucky if he has got five friends who are really good friends. But what happens is subliminally, if a person were to lose 2,000 friends, it's almost a subliminal loss that 2,000 people don't like me anymore. Mm. Right? Like, whether you're good looking or not good looking is being told by a website. Mm. It's being told by an advertisement. Do you have a beach ready body? Do you have a tan? Mm -hmm. Do you have chiseled features? Do you have, you know, a, a sharp nose? These are subliminal messages which are being fed into people's head. Have you and seen the social dilemma? Uh, I have seen it and I, I think it is constant, but this is nothing new. I mean, it used to happen in advertising even earlier. But what is happening is that constantly people are being told you're not good enough. You're not mm. good. You're not good enough. You're bad. You're not, you're not good. Now, if you, I mean, give a dog a bad name, the dog will turn into a bad dog. So constantly, if an individual is getting that you're not enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, you're not doing enough, it'll start 
actually subliminally making that person feel guilty make that person feel under confident and make that person unhappy because if somebody tells you you are good looking you feel happy and somebody tells you you are not good looking you feel unhappy your looks have not changed at all nothing has changed in your looks your looks are exactly the same it is how many people say you are good looking versus how many people you can do nothing about it it is what people's opinion is about you now i think we should care about people but we should not care what people think about us but unfortunately in today's world we don't care about people but we care more about what they think about us mm. right and they don't think about very much about us anyway but in our belief we are thinking that they think about us they think about us all the time it happens it happens to all of us you know you get a thousand likes and 23 dislikes you'll go and see a dislike kisne kiya bhai who is the one so you won't look at the thousand who have liked you the 23 dis- who may have disliked you for re- i mean you may have reminded him of some class bully it could be any reason yeah, it's called but a negative bias cycle negative bias so the moment you get into that so i think this generation of I, I, the 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 I, I, like i said i don't want to use the word mental health but i think the importance of creating a psychologically safe environment at home in schools in workplaces and in common grounds common meeting grounds if we don't address this uh, i don't know if you are aware that the mental health ailments are 37% indians are affected by it physical ailments only 17% so it's double of uh, uh, physical health and physical health is very tangible if you break a leg people will be kind towards you because oh you got a broken leg come come you sit over here but if you have a mental health problem people are not kind towards you they mm. are unkind towards <laughs> you right wow. it is true they are unkind towards you so basically i think this is going to become one of the biggest challenges which if we don't address now and covid is only going to exacerbate it and i i the one message that i really want to share i think even for a lot of corporates you know when they ask me that how can we improve our efficiencies and how can we do our uh, you know this platform and that transition and this transformation i must be at least intervening on six or seven transformations in organization multi crore transformations and i'm reminded of a you know physics uh, uh, tuition master we had who sometimes to pull his leg physics chemistry to teach us both to pull his leg we used to you know tell him that uh, why don't we learn alchemy so that we can turn lead into gold and he would laugh at us and we knew we are trying to pull his leg and he would tell us that do you know this light bulb this old light bulbs that we used to have this 80% of the energy that is fed into the light bulb it goes into heat and only 20% converts into light actually less than that and says if you just make that 20% 40% you would make a revolution in scientific world which is to now led lights do that now similarly in an organization which is going with platform revolution transition and this and that did you know that in a gallup survey as late as 2015 they found that in an organization typical mnc large corporate or large organizations less than 20% of the employees are actively engaged 60% are waiting for the chartered bus time to you know looking at the clock mm-hmm. kaise kar nikalne ka hai 20% are actually sabotaging the company because they hate that or they dislike or whatever there so if this 20% engage can just be made into 40% that organization will have an exponential growth of 100% mm. right so this area if corporates start recognizing that mental health is a direct correlation with engagement so rather than optimizing workforce which i am asked to do many many times companies come to me and say can you optimize my workforce i think with optimization what they have in mind ki jo 15 logon ka kaam hai wo 12 log kaise kare 12 log ka kaam hai jo technology laga ke 6 log kaise kare i think is the wrong way to look at it the right way to look at it is how may we engage those 12 people so fully that their work output is of 24 people happiness mm. level is of 24 people that to my mind is an area that uh, is going to be a really interesting uh, space uh, to work in and i i would actually urge a lot of leaders now uh, rather than studying management theories which are based 20 30 years ago all our management theories are based on the assembly line the quotas the bell curve which is 20 30 years ago uh, i think they should be studying psychology now 100%. right now i'm sure in school you have answered this question in some exam usually maths exam 
that if eight people can dig a 14 feet hole in 10 days, then how many people will take to dig it in four days? The correct answer to that is depends on the people. <laughs> Totally depends on the people and their state of mind. It's got nothing to do with 18, 12, 14. And the leader. And the leader, of course. The people and the leader, leader actually transforms the state of mind mm -hmm. to positive or to negative, both ways. So I think that answer is the answer that we need the youth to start understanding now. That people are not automatons. They are not mechanical units. They are not even people. They are brothers, sisters, cousins, somebody's son, someone's daughter, someone's happy daughter on a good day someone's sad daughter on another day, that's the dynamic we are uh, working with. And I think this area we really need to bring to focus because uh, one thing I have, you asked me what I'm good at, and, and this is somewhat of a track record that I'm kind of, I have usually had the ability to see a major threat coming well before it came. Uh, when Mahindra SSG was formed at that point of time. Information security was not even the radar of banks. Even banks did not realize it. I remember many, many years ago, once I was talking to this Fiki and CII and all these leaders, Anand was there in that meeting. And I said, these Naxals are going to become a huge problem. I said, kya baat kar Naxals, they are in the back of beyond Teer Kaman leke ladte wo log and all that. I think our biggest threat that we are looking at, which will form the bedrock of all threats, because if you have a mentally unstable environment, it's very easy to cause any form of instability in it. When suicide rates start going up, suicide bombers can also go up. Because if the guy is going to commit suicide, why not commit suicide while blowing himself up? So I think we need to really be aware that this is one area where I think not just corporate India, India should really be looking at. And post the pandemic, it has exacerbated to a huge degree. Uh, as a country, as medical institutions, there is not enough attention on it. More importantly, in India, there is a stigma attached to it. So the moment you... Uh, fascinatingly, I was talking to uh, a very, very uh, senior uh, therapist who told me this, that every individual, every individual from the age of 1 to 70 will have some mental health issue at least two or three times. Mm. It's like viral fever. Everyone gets it. Many people get it, get out of it. Many people are not able to get out of it. That's the way it should be treated and not as some you know, type of that stigma. And I think um, this is the right time for uh, a lot of us to start thinking about it for two reasons. One, it is a big problem. And second, it's been mainstreamed. Mm. There is no stigma. You know, a lot of organizations are talking about mental health post-COVID and all of that. I think this is one area which I would urge the youth, especially one in seven Indians is suffering from some form of mental health, which means one out of the seven people you know maybe even including you, is suffering from it. The remaining six have to watch out for that one. Mm. Uh, that's the only way. Because it could be you. Like I said, it's, yes. it's, it's not one person. It could be any one of us. So I think that's one area which I really see as a challenge, a of, challenge our generation. Of, of your generation. It I is a so. challenge of your generation. Your, your generation is in a very, very psychologically say, unsafe environment. Mm. Uh, I, when I was growing up, was encouraged by my parents to read the newspaper every day. I doubt whether Shardul will encourage his daughter to read the newspaper yeah, these yeah. days, right? Absolutely. So imagine the psychological unsafety that has happened yeah. in, in a matter of, and that's that's one of the key areas that your generation will have to deal yeah. with. Maybe one step in combating this problem is sharing the Ranveer show, yeah. uh, which well. is, uh, <laughs> it's positive content that's trying to change the world and make it a happier, more positive place. Captain Raghur, I will do that. I'll share your show for <laughs> sure. <laughs> right, thank you. Thank you Thanks so much Adan. for being Great on speaking with you. episode 3 of this journey. Again, lots more content to be created with you over the years. We'll do that. But uh, really appreciate all the knowledge, sir. Thanks, Adan. Uh, you know what you said about you getting knowledge from Deepak Jain? Uh -huh. uh, I feel that a lot. With oh, I get a lot of stuff from you. I found out yeah. about two shows and you told me about, you know, <laughs> entirely. It's, 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 if you become a sponge, knowledge will come from everywhere. Yeah. You don't have to look up or niche, It's all, all around us. Yeah, that's a big blessing of my life to be able to do these podcasts and call it my source of living and my purpose. Uh, that I have to just sit, gain knowledge from you. People. I think the only guy who gets paid for getting educated here. Yeah, yeah exa exactly. Right? <laughs> it's exactly that. So. People underestimate the power of what happens to the podcast too, course, through course, this journey. Course. I mean, it's uh, any interaction with anybody, it, it adds a completely different dimension. I get to, to live your life through your words. Or at least, uh, you know, 
don't make the same mistakes yeah. or, or 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 even if that mistake has happened you say it's not unique many other people have done it and you know so it, it puts a perspective which i think is great and those who listen to your show as well yes thank you sir really appreciate it again i'll be linking all of sir's handles down below and until next time from ranveer and captain raghuraman we will see you later thanks satan look forward to seeing you again soon